Little Klaus and Big Klaus from The Tales of Hans Christian Andersen. There were two men in one village who both had the very same name. They were both called Klaus. One of them owned four horses, the other only one. And to tell them from each other, people called the man who had four horses Big Klaus and the man who had only one horse Little Klaus. Now let us hear how these two got on, for this is a true story. All through the week, Little Klaus had to plow for Big Klaus and lend him his one horse. In return, Big Klaus gave him the help of all his four horses, but only once a week, and that was on Sunday. My word, how Little Klaus did crack his whip over all five horses. They were as good as his for that one day. The sun shone so pleasantly, and the church bells were all ringing for church. The villagers went by in their Sunday best, with their hymn books under their arms, to hear the parson preach, and when they looked at little Klaus plowing with five horses, he was so delighted that he cracked his whip once more and cried out, Gee up, all my horses! You mustn't say that, said Big Klaus. There's only one horse, you know, which is yours. But when some more people went past on their way to church, Little Klaus forgot that he wasn't to say that, and cried out again, Gee up, all of my horses! Look here, will you kindly give over? said Big Klaus. The next time you say that, I'll give your horse a clump on the head and kill him on the spot, and that'll be goodbye to him. I promise you I won't say it again, said Little Klaus. But when some more people went by and they nodded good morning to him, he was so delighted and felt that it must look so smart for him to have five horses to plow his fields with, that he cracked his whip and cried out, Gee up, all my horses. I'll gee up your horses for you, said Big Klaus, and he took the mallet from the tether peg and gave Little Klaus's one horse such a clump on the forehead that it fell down stone dead. Oh dear, now I haven't a horse at all, said Little Klaus and began to cry. By and by he flayed the dead horse and took the hide and gave it a thorough drying in the wind. Then he stuck it in a bag, which he threw over his shoulder, and went off to the next town to sell his horse hide. He had a long way to go, and it led through a big, gloomy wood. Presently a terrible storm got up, and he quite lost his way. It was evening before he could find it again, and he was much too far from the town or from home to be able to reach either before night fell. Close to the road stood a large farmhouse. The windows had the shutters up outside, but yet a gleam of light showed over the top of them. I dare say I can get leave to spend the night there, thought little Klaus, and went up and knocked at the door. The farmer wife came and opened it, but when she heard what he wanted, she told him to be off as her husband was not at home, and she didn't take in strangers. Oh, well, in that case I must find a bed out of doors, said Little Klaus, and the farmer's wife shut the door in his face. Nearby was a big haystack, and between this and the house a little shed had been built with a flat thatch roof to it. I can sleep up there, said Little Klaus, catching sight of the roof. That will be a lovely bed, and I shouldn't think the stork will fly down and bite my legs for a real live stork was standing up there on the roof where it had its nest. Little Klaus now crawled up onto the shed where he lay and wriggled himself to get really comfortable. The wooden shutters didn't quite cover the windows up at the top, and so he was able to see right into the room. There was a large table with wine and roast meat and, oh, such a delicious-looking fish. The farmer's wife and the parish clerk were sitting at table all by themselves, and she kept filling up his glass for him, and he kept helping himself to the fish. He was very fond of fish. If only I could get a taste of that, thought little Klaus, craning out his neck towards the window. Heavens, what a gorgeous cake he could see in there. It was really a wonderful spread. Then he heard someone riding along the road towards the house. It was the farmer himself coming home. Now, although he was an excellent man, the farmer had the strange failing that he never could bear the sight of a parish clerk. If he ever set eyes on a clerk, he flew into an absolute rage, and that was just why this clerk had called in to pass the time of day with the farmer's wife, when he knew that her husband was away from home, 
and the good woman set before him all the nicest things to eat that she could find. And now, when they heard the husband coming, they got so scared that the woman begged the clerk to creep into a big empty closet which stood over in the corner. So he climbed in, for he knew quite well that the poor man couldn't bear the sight of a parish clerk. The woman quickly hid away all the delicious food and wine inside her oven, because if her husband had seen it, he would have been sure to ask what it all meant. Oh dear, said little Klaus up on the shed when he saw the food disappearing. Is that somebody up there? asked the farmer, peering up at little Klaus. What are you lying up there for? Much better come along of me into the house. Little Klaus then explained how he had lost his way and asked if he might stop the night. Why, certainly, said the farmer, but first we must have a bit of something to eat. The farmer's wife gave them both a most friendly welcome, laid a long table, and gave them a large bowl of porridge. The farmer was hungry, and he ate with a good appetite, but little Klaus couldn't help thinking about the lovely roast meat, the fish, and the cake, which he knew were inside the oven. Under the table, at his feet, he had placed his sack with the horse hide in it, for we mustn't forget it was the hide which he had brought away with him from home in order to sell it in the town. He didn't care for the porridge at all, and so he trod on his bag and the dry hide inside it gave it a, quite a loud squeak. Shh, said little Klaus to his sack, but at the same time he trod on it again and it gave out a still louder squeak. Why, whatever have you got in that there bag? asked the farmer. Oh, it's a wizard, said little Klaus. He says that we shouldn't be eating porridge. He has conjured the whole oven full of meat and fish and cake. You don't say so, said the farmer. And in a twinkling he opened the oven and saw all the delicious food which his wife had hidden away, though he thought himself that the wizard had conjured it there. His wife didn't dare say a word. She put the food straight on the table, and they both made a good meal off the fish and the meat and the cake. Presently, little Klaus trod on his bag once more and made the hide squeak. "'What's he say now?' asked the farmer. "'He says,' answered little Klaus, "'that he has also conjured us three bottles of wine, "'and they're in the oven, too.' So the wife had to bring out the wine she had hidden, and the farmer drank and became quite merry, for he'd give anything to win a wizard like the one little Klaus had got in his bag. "'Can he also make the devil appear?' asked the farmer. I should so like to see him now that I'm feeling so cheerful. Certainly, said little Klaus. My wizard can do whatever I like to ask him. Can't you, old man? And at the same time he trod on the bag so that it squeaked. Did you hear him? He says, yes, of course he can. But the devil's so hideous that you'd better not see him. Oh, I'm not afraid. What do you think he'll look like? Well, you'll find he's the very image of a parish clerk. Ah, said the farmer, that's hideous and no mistake. You know, I can't bear the sight of parish clerks. But never mind. I know it's the devil this time, and as I reckon, I'll put up with it for once. I'm full of pluck just now, but don't let him come too near. Now I'll ask my wizard, said little Klaus, treading on the bag and turning his ear to it. What's he say? He says you may go up and open the chest, which is standing over there in the corner and you'll see the devil squatting inside. But mind you hold on to the lid, or he'll slip out. Come and help me hold it, then, said the farmer, going across to the chest in which his wife had hidden the real clerk, who sat there trembling with fear. The farmer raised the little, little way and peeped in under it. Ugh, he shrieked and jumped back from the chest. Yes, I saw him right enough. He looked the dead spit of our clerk. Oh, it was horrible. And they had to have a drink after that, and they went on drinking far into the night. You must sell me that wizard, said the farmer. Ask what you like for him. I tell you what, I'll give you a whole bushel of money straight away. No, said Klaus, I can't do that. Just think of the profit I can make out of this wizard. Oh, but I'm fair crazy to have him, said the farmer, and he begged and pleaded till at last little Klaus said, Yes. You've been very kind and given me a good night's lodging, so it doesn't make much odds. You shall have the wizard for a bushel of money, but full measure, mind you. Right you are, 
said the farmer, but you must take that there chest with you. I won't have it another hour in the place. He may be in there yet, for all we can tell. Little Klaus gave the farmer his sack with the dry hide in it, and got a whole bushel of money, full measure in exchange. What's more, the farmer gave him a large barrow on which to wheel away the chest and the money. Goodbye, said Little Klaus, and off he went, trundling his money in the great chest with the clerk still in it. On the other side of the wood ran a deep river, where the current was so strong that you could hardly swim against it. A big bridge had lately been built across it, and Little Klaus halted when he got to the middle, and said out loud, so that the clerk in the chest could hear him, Hang it all! Whatever am I to do with this stupid chest? It's so heavy you'd think it was full of stones. I'm sick and tired of wheeling it, so I'll just tip it into the river. Then if it sails home to me, very good. And if it doesn't, well, it can't be helped. Then he took hold of the chest by one of the handles and tilted it a bit, as though he meant to hurl it down into the water. Stop, stop, shouted the clerk from inside the chest. Let me out. Oh, do let me out. Good. Gracious, said Little Klaus, and pretended to be frightened. He's still inside. I must push him into the river at once, and then he'll drown. No, no, shouted the clerk. I'll give you a whole bushel of money if you'll only let me out. Ah, that's another story, said Little Klaus, and opened the chest. The clerk quickly crept out, pushed the empty chest into the water, and went to his home, where Little Klaus was given a whole bushel of money. He had already got one out of the farmer, so that here he was now with his wheelbarrow chock full of money. I got rather a good prize for that horse, he said to himself, when he came home to his own room and turned out all the money in a big heap on the floor. Big Klaus will be very annoyed when he hears how rich I become out of my one horse, but all the same I won't tell him straight away. Presently he sent a boy along to Big Klaus to borrow a bushel measure. I wonder what he wants that for, thought Big Klaus, and he smeared the bottom with tar so the little of whatever was measured might stick to it. And sure enough, when the measure came back, there were three new silver florins sticking to it. Hello, what's this? said Big Klaus, and ran straight off to Little Klaus. Where did you get all this money from? No, oh, that was for my horse hide that I sold yesterday. That's a wonderful good price, said Big Klaus. And he ran home, took an axe, and gave all his four horses a clump on the forehead. Then he stripped off the hides and trundled them away into the town. Hides! Hides! Who will buy my hides? he shouted through the streets. All the shoemakers and tanners came running up and asking how much he wanted for them. A bushel of money apiece, said Big Klaus. Are you mad? they all asked him. Do you suppose we keep money in bushels? Hides, hides, who will buy my hides? he shouted again. But to everyone who asked him the price, he answered, A bushel of money. He's trying to make fools of us, they all said. And then the shoemakers took their straps and the tanners their leather aprons and began to give Big Klaus a good beating. Hides! Hides! they mocked at him. We'll give you a hide that'll be like a pig. Out of the town with him! they shouted. And Big Klaus had to bolt for his life. He'd never had such a drubbing. All right, he said when he got home. Little Klaus shall pay for this. I'll beat his brains out. But at Little Klaus' home, his old grandmother had just died. It's true, she'd always been very cross and unkind to him. Still, he was very much grieved and took the dead woman and laid her in his own warm bed to see if he couldn't bring her to life again. She was to lie there all night while he himself would sit over in the corner and sleep on a chair. It wouldn't be the first time he had done that. During the night, as he was sitting there, the door opened and Big Klaus came in with an axe. He knew quite well where Little Klaus' bed was, so he went straight up to it and, thinking the dead grandmother was Little Klaus, gave her a great clump on the forehead. There now, he said, you're not going to make a fool of me again. And he went back home. What a very wicked man, said Little Klaus to himself. It's clear that he meant to kill me. 
Anyhow, it's a good thing for the old dame that she was dead already. Otherwise, he would have taken her life. And now he dressed up the old grandmother in her Sunday clothes, borrowed a horse from his neighbor, harnessed it to the cart, and set up the old grandmother in the back seat, so that she couldn't fall out when he drove faster. And away they bowled through the woods. By sunrise, they were outside a large inn, where little Klaus drew up and went inside to get something to eat. The landlord of the inn had plenty of money, and was a very kind man, too. But he was hot-tempered, as if it were full of pepper and snuff. Good morning, he said to little Klaus. You're out early today in your best clothes. Yes, said little Klaus. I'm off to town with my old grandmother. She's sitting out in the cart. Can't get her to come in here. Will you take her a large glass of honey wine? But you must speak rather loud, for she's a bit deaf. Right you are, said the landlord, and poured out a large glass of honey wine, which he took out with him to the dead grandmother, who was propped up in the cart. Here's a glass of honey wine from your grandson, lady, said the landlord, but the dead woman never said a word nor moved a muscle. Can't you hear? cried the landlord at the top of his voice. Here's a glass of honey wine from your grandson. Once more he shouted it out, and yet again after that. But as she never stirred, he lost his temper and threw the glass right into her face, so that the wine ran down over her nose, and she toppled over backwards into the cart. For she was only propped up and not fastened in. Ha! Huh, what's this? cried little Klaus, rushing out and seizing the landlord by the throat. You've been and killed my grandmother. Just look, there's a big hole in her forehead. Oh, dear, that's a bit of bad luck, cried the landlord, wringing his hands. That all comes from my hot temper. Dear, kind little Klaus, I'll give you a whole bushel of money and bury your grandmother as if she was my own. If only you'll not say a word, otherwise they'll cut off my head. And that is so disagreeable. So little Klaus got a whole bushel of money, and the landlord buried his old grandmother as if she had been his own. As soon as little Klaus got back home with all his money, he sent his boy along to Big Klaus to ask if he'd lend him a bushel measure. Hello, what's this? said Big Klaus. Didn't I kill him? I really must see about this myself. And he went over to little Klaus with the measure. Why, wherever have you got all this money from? he asked. And my goodness, how he opened his eyes when he saw all the fresh money that had come in. It was my grandmother you killed, not me, said little Klaus. It's she I've just sold and got a bushel of money for. That's a wonderful price, said Big Klaus, and hurried home, took an axe, and quickly killed his old grandmother. Then he placed her in the cart, and drove into town where the doctor lived, and asked if he wanted to buy a dead body. Whose is it, and where did you get it, asked the doctor. It's my old grandmother, said Big Klaus. I killed her to get a bushel of money. Good gracious, said the doctor. You don't know what you're saying. Don't go babbling like that, or you may lose your head. And then he told him frankly what a dreadfully wicked thing he had done, and what a bad man he was, and that he ought to be punished. This made Big Klaus so frightened that he rushed straight out of the surgery into the cart, whipped up the horses, and made for home. But the doctor and the rest of them thought he was mad, and so they left him to drive where he liked. You shall pay for this, said Big Klaus, once he was out on the high road. Yes, you shall certainly pay for this, little Klaus. And as soon as he got home, he took the biggest sack he could find, went along to little Klaus, and said, You've been and fooled me again. First I killed my horses, and then my old grandmother. It was your fault both times, but you shan't fool me any more. And he caught hold of little Klaus by the waist, thrust him into the sack, slung him over his shoulder, and called out to him, Now I'm going to take you out and drown you. There was some distance to go before he came to the river, and little Klaus was no light weight to carry. The road went past the church, and the sound of the organ playing and the people singing was so beautiful that Big Klaus put down his sack, with little Klaus inside it, near by the church door, and thought it would be nice to go in and listen to a hymn first before he went any further. Little Klaus couldn't possibly get out, and everybody was in church, so in he went. 
Oh dear, oh dear, said Little Klaus inside the sack. He wriggled and wriggled, but he couldn't possibly manage to get the string unfastened. Just then an old cattle drover came up. His hair was as white as chalk, and he leaned on a big stick as he drove a whole herd of cows and bullocks in front of him. These ran up to the sack in which Little Klaus was sitting and overturned it. Oh dear, sighed Little Klaus, I'm so young to go to heaven. We're going to repeat just one line because of the train. Oh dear, sighed Little Klaus, I'm so young to go to heaven. And poor me, said the drover, I'm so old and I can't get there. Open the sack, called out Little Klaus. Crawl in here instead of me and you'll soon get to heaven. Uh, I'd give anything for that, said the drover, and he unfastened the sack for Little Klaus, who jumped out at once. You'll mind the cattle, won't you? said the old man as he crawled into the bag. Little Klaus tied it up and went on his way with all the cows and bullocks. Soon after, Big Klaus came out of the church and put the sack over his shoulder again. Sure enough, he noticed that it seemed lighter, for the old drover wasn't more than half the weight of Little Klaus. How light he's become. No doubt it's because I listened to him. Then off he went to the river, which was a deep one, and threw the sack with the old drover inside it right out into the stream, and shouted after him, thinking, of course, it was Little Klaus. There now, you shan't fool me any more. Then he turned homeward, but when he came to the crossroads, he met Little Klaus driving off with all his cattle. Hello, what's this? said Big Klaus. Didn't I drown you? Yes, you did, said Little Klaus. You threw me to the river barely half an hour ago. But where did you get all those fine cattle from? asked Big Klaus. They're sea cattle, said Little Klaus. I must tell you the whole story. And by the by, thank you so much for drowning me. I'm in luck's way now. I'm really rich, I can tell you. I was very frightened as I lay inside the sack with the wind whistling round my ears when you threw me down off the bridge into the cold water. I sank straight to the bottom, but it didn't hurt myself because down there grows the finest, softest grass. As I came down on this, the bag at once opened and the most lovely girl dressed in pure white with a green garland on her wet hair took my hand and said, is that you, little louse? There are a few cattle for you to go on with. About four miles further up the road, there's another drove of them, which I'll make you a present of. Then I could see that the river was a great high road for the sea people. Down there at the bottom, they walked and drove straight out of the sea, and then right away inland to where the river rises. It was delightful down there, what with flowers and the freshest grass and fishes swimming about in the water and darting past my ears as birds do in the air up here. What a fine folk there were, and what cattle to be met with along the hedges and ditches. But why have you come up again to us in such a hurry? asked Big Klaus. I wouldn't have done that if it was so beautiful down there. Ah, but that's just what I'd rather have been cunning, said Little Klaus. You remember I told you that the sea maiden said, about four miles further up the road, and by the road she means, of course, the river, and she can't go anywhere else. There's another drove of cattle waiting for me. Well, I know how the river keeps winding in and out. It would be in a very roundabout way, you know. So, if you can do it, it's much shorter to come up on land and drive straight across to the river again. You see, I save almost half the distance that way, and get to my sea cattle more quickly. Oh, a lucky man you are said Big Klaus. Do you think I shall get some sea cattle too if I go down to the bottom of the river? I should just think you would, said Little Klaus. But I can't carry you as far as the river in the sack. You're too heavy. If you'll go there yourself and then crawl into the bag, I'll throw you into the water with the greatest of pleasure. Thanks very much, said Big Klaus. But if I don't find any sea cattle when I get down there, I'll give you such a beating, I can tell you. Oh, no, don't be so cruel. So they went off to the river. The cattle were thirsty, and when they saw the water, they trotted off as fast as they could, so as to get down and have a drink. Look at what a hurry they're in, said Little Klaus. They're longing to get down to the bottom again. 
Yes, but help me first, said Big Klaus, or you will get your beating. And then he crawled into the big sack, which had been lying across the back of one of the herd. You better put a stone in it, or else I'm afraid I mayn't sink, said Big Klaus. I expect you'll sink all right, said Little Klaus. Still, he put a big stone in the sack, tied the string tight, and then gave it a good push. Plump! There was Big Klaus out in the river, and he sank straight to the bottom. I'm afraid he won't find his cattle, said Little Klaus, and drove off home with what he had. The End <laughs>